Hello, my name is David Ades. I'm a poet, I live in Sydney, and for the last couple of years I've been running a poetry reading series called Poets Corner, where I invite a poet to read and talk uh, about their poetry centred on a theme of the poet's choice. Uh, I've been running this series in conjunction with West Words out of Parramatta. And I'll just uh, give you a little bit of background about West Words. West Words is Western Sydney's literature development organisation. Poets Corner is part of West Words public programming that celebrates the richness, diversity and insight literature offers. Especially in these times, we thank the ongoing support of Create New South Wales, the Cultural Fund of Copyright Australia, City of Parramatta Council, Blacktown City Council and Campbelltown City Council as well as the many project partners that have enabled us to continue to provide opportunities to writers and audiences. We hope that this new world will see us sharing and a closeness of spirit. So a little bit of background. I have mentioned already the history of this uh, reading series. Um, I mentioned last time when I was interviewing um, Anne Casey that the inspiration came from a uh, Poets Corner reading series that's been undertaken in Adelaide uh, and that invited me to read uh, more than a decade ago, I made an error and I would like to correct it. I said last time that the organisation running that uh, series is called uh, the Effective Learning Centre. In, in fact, it's the Effective Living Centre, which makes a lot more sense. Uh, so that's that correction I desperately wanted to make today. Uh, so now we uh, have transitioned to doing uh, this these um, readings and discussions by podcast, uh, at least for the time being, so that we can share with as many people as we can. Uh, I'd like to start off as I always do with an, an acknowledgement of country. I'm recording this from my home in Beecroft in Sydney. Our guest poet today, Andy Jackson, uh, whom I'll introduce uh, to you in a moment, is recording from his home in Castlemaine in Victoria. Uh, before we begin, I would like to pay my respects to and acknowledge the elders, past, present and emerging of the Wallamita people, the traditional custodians of the land in Beecroft, and also of the Jajawurung people, the traditional custodians of the land in Castlemaine, and to acknowledge that their land has never been ceded or given up. Now, I'll just give you a brief introductory bio of Andy Jackson. Uh, he could have sent me a much longer one than he did. <laughs> <laughs> Andy Jackson's first published book of poems, Among the Regulars, was shortlisted for the 2011 Kenneth Slessor Prize for Poetry. And his most recent collection, Music Our Bodies Can't Hold, which consists of portrait poems of other people with Marfan syndrome, was shortlisted for the 2020 John Bray Poetry Award. He has co-edited disability themed issues of the literary journals Southerly and Australian Poetry Journal. And he has been a creative writing teacher and tutor for community organizations and universities. And you can engage with his work through his website, amongtheregulars.com. And he has selected as his theme for Poets Corner, Other Bodies. Hi Andy, welcome to Poets Corner. Thanks, David. Um, yeah, really fantastic uh, to be invited and yeah, looking forward to our chat. Uh, it's a great format and yeah, I'm sure we'll get to some interesting places for sure. Never know where we're going to get, but... No, um, that's right. So I'd like to start with a question. I find myself wanting to ask every poet. Mm. Um, I don't know if other people are interested in this, but I'm always interested in this because <laughs> you never know what the answers are. How did you come to become a poet? Ah, oh, it's a... It's, it's funny, it should be really clear and obvious, like, oh yes, that's how, how it happened. Um, you know, if I think back to my school years, I don't remember reading poetry or studying poetry when I was younger. It just sort of slowly but surely evolved. Um, I would, you know, write things quietly, you know, just privately in my own little notebooks when I was growing up. But it sort of accelerated as the years went on, I think the two main reasons I became a poet, uh, one of them was to, I was when I was a teenager, a, um, 
evangelical Christian. And after a number of years, it became obvious that that's really not who I was <laughs> and not what I was really interested in, you know, remaining. So a lot of the writing was about trying to understand, you know, my place in the world and to not be, to, have to find meaning, you know, in language and find meaning in humanity and in the world without having a construct around it. But the other reason really for me, and this has continued a lot more in my work, is because I'm someone who's physically different, um, disabled or whatever you want to call it, I was really aware, always aware when I was growing up that other people see me as different and make assumptions about me. And poetry for me was a way of kind of speaking back to that and perhaps making the story more complicated and mm -hmm. more authentic and more real, um, especially live poetry. So, I mean, I do a lot of stuff uh, on the page, obviously, and I've had a couple of books out, but I'm also really interested in live performance um, because that's it's a very immediate and very embodied kind of way of experiencing poetry. So. Yeah, it's a long way around, but look, I, it's, it's, it's always been through the body, I think, that I've found poetry and, and how I keep finding it. Yeah, well, I mean, it's the topic, isn't it? Your topic, your theme is other bodies. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to perhaps go into that in a little bit more detail. You've started mm -hmm. off on that, but um, the body obviously is a very common subject in poetry. Uh, what mm -hmm. poet has not in some form or other addressed the subject of the body, whether it's you know, love or romantic or um, more sexualized poetry or um, talking about uh, the aging of the body and damage mm. to the body and um, losses suffered. Mm. Um, but the term other bodies intrigued me. Um, yeah. I, I mentioned it to a friend of mine the other day and he said, oh, you're talking about celestial bodies. I said, I don't think that's what ah. it's about. So mm. I just wanted to ask you what you mean and to explore a little bit about what you mean by the term other bodies. Yeah. Yeah. Look, it's, it's kind of related to uh, what you said before is so true that, you know, if you look at poetry anthologies, uh, the body's everywhere and poetry is very much about bodies. But what I seem to find is this idea so often that um, this sort of one body, you know, it's almost as if uh, they're all the same. And it may be, you might have two, maybe there's a male body and a female body, but um, the reality for me is that everyone's body is so different. And while we've got things in common, uh, there's a real diversity in how we experience it. So it's very easy to assume you know what someone else's body is like. Uh, or what they're capable of, or what they experience, or what they feel. Uh, so the idea of other bodies, I guess, for me, is very much about, yes, we can really have deep affinity with other people, but um, it's important to respect the, the distance between us as well as the, the intimacy. Mm. Um, yeah, and I, I like that kind of uh, ambiguity of other bodies in terms of just literally other people, other bodies, you know, uh, but also otherness too, that, you know, uh, bodies can be other to us, can, can seem different and um, unsettlingly different. Mm. But of course, the other side of that is that maybe they're not as different as we think. So I kind of like those two opposites working together that, you know, yeah, we're really different, but we're also quite um, intimately connected to each other. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't know if you've come across, uh, there's a journal in Pittsburgh run by Jill Corey called uh, Rogue Agent Journal, which ah, is yeah. devoted entirely to questions of the body, poetry about the body. Um, yes, I've seen it, but I haven't seen it for a while. So if it's still going, I'll have to um, get it's back in. Yeah. Great. Well, you've asked me to do that horrendous task, <laughs> collecting <laughs> poems for you to read from your last two books, um, I've done my best. And we're gonna do um, poems from your book, Immune Systems, uh, first, uh, which is a book largely set 
in India. And, uh, and I wanted to ask you, how did you come to write this book? How did you come to be in India and how did you come to write this book? Yeah. Look, that's it's funny. That's also a really difficult question to answer on some level because I can't really trace where my original interest in uh, that wonderful country uh, came from. Uh, I ended up going to, to India in uh, 2008, 2009, and then again in 2011. Um, and so this book comes out of those two trips. Um, the book's effectively in two halves, and one half is one trip, and the other is uh, the other. Uh, and yeah, it just has, from the kind of moment I landed, uh, speaking of otherness, you know, you, you, it's a place that is just completely, uh, you don't know it until you've been there. And it's very much a different way of, of being in the world. Certainly a really kind of fascinating, uh, unsettling, beautiful, uh, intriguing place. Um, so, and yeah, as time went on, it, it, spending time there, it was obvious that I was going to write while I was there. Um, yeah, so this book is really kind of partly written in India, but also partly written coming back from it as well. So yeah. there's that element too. Yeah. Well, it's wonderful. And, um, I've chosen some poems and I'd love you to read them. Um, and I'd love you to start off with the, your gazal, uh, Kolkata. Yeah, sure. There's no probably need for me to introduce this too much. Um, the poetic form, the gazal, uh, you'll hear it in the sound of the poem. Uh, it'll become obvious. And this poem effectively is kind of the, I guess an arrival poem. It's the, the kind of first, uh, Gazal that is really set inside um, the land itself in Kolkata. Frayed saris and squares of newsprint approximate rooms on the street. Necessities flesh, haircuts, tie repair, graves and wounds on the street. Poetry dives, hides deep in the bones. Your body's lost splutters in this tidal scent of rubbish, food, urine, diesel fumes on the street. Your city's hushed, ordered as a court. Here, blood's timid whispers are lost. Lone clearing men hack, a backfiring taxi booms on the street. They play carom or cards, laugh and smoke and haggle over fruit. Other bodies are carried past, on beds to their tombs on the street. You make an air-conditioned bookstore your temporary shelter. The cold shadow of a smiling shoeless child looms on the street. Sure, curse the caged gods, run from the city's cacophonous song. You'll walk the siren aisle, just another of her grooms on the street. The limbs of the chilly tree are swathed in the purda of dust and getting on with it. It's urgent red display as it blooms on the street. Cows asleep on the median strip, 20 men sweating in a jeep, defecating kids waving hello, mandirs of dusty mandarins, kerosene wafting through a frayed curtain, all life's undisguised perfumes on the street. Yeah, what intrigued me, what, what, I've been to India, so I ah. related to that a lot. Uh, I love the poet's eye. I, I guess almost it's like any newcomer's eye to India. You're, you're, there's, it's an assault on the senses, mm. visual and other, and um, you capture that very vividly, I think. And, of course, everything happens on the street. Uh, yeah. It's kind of... Yeah. Uh, yeah, very much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's certainly a, a, a shock when you come back because you get used to things happening on the street and then you come to Australia and you'll return to Australia and it's, uh, where is everybody? You know, it's not just numbers of people, but the sort of way, the places that life happens is not there on the street. Yeah, this book is very alive with that life. And the, yeah. And so, 
it's wonderful. I mean, I didn't write poetry in India and I couldn't have written this. Um, I, I was too busy trying to assimilate it and make sense of it in other ways, but, but yeah. uh, uh, it's fabulous to see it um, encapsulated in, in, in a poem like this. Um, Ghazal of the Other, which is mm. the next one that I want you to read, is in a completely different setting, but you've, you, you, you've still used the same form. Yep. Yeah, I, I did, and you probably, uh, for those who've read the book or who want to read the book, uh, I use the form quite strictly in some places and others sort of break it down. Um, and this one kind of plays with that a little bit. So there is a similar refrain, but I'm sort of playing with it particularly. Um, and this is, I guess, uh, on return, I think. I think it's sort of the, the coming home. Um, still disoriented, but also, yeah, this something of India is in it, I think. Uh, Guzzle of the Other. Our senses are desperate cannibals, lost concerning God. The body a maze, limbs dead ends, self spurning the other. Your clothes on the line, sails of memory, pull my body. No raft, no boy, no flare here, just this churning desire. God, I offered you money, my body, the fuel of my shame, all my Tourette's prayers answered with burning silence. I'd climb into the soft curves of a font, yet even ink bleeds. Other lives move through us, worms turning the earth. The leashed dog dragging the table down the footpath is my guru, I who self watches its adjourning body. Look, my skin's roar where you were torn from me. But were you ever here? Love prefers love to discerning truth. Your breasts pressed against my belly. In time, my flesh will forget itself, but for now holds this returning home. Not the empty exchange of speech, but the slow approach, silence, an aimless circling and unfolding, learning Petals of stolen roses wilt and drift to our kitchen floor. Guzzles, bad actors, as if they know yearning, love. Love prefers love to discerning truth. Oh, a beautiful line. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. Now, I know poems have to stand on their own two feet <laughs> and, and shouldn't, shouldn't be explained. But uh, you talked about complexity, and it seems to me that there are currents of things going on in your poems, some of which are apparent and some of which are not. Um, I'm not going to ask you to tell me what this poem's about, but could you tell me a little bit more about, about the poem? Yeah. Look, it's, um, I think it's partly influenced by um, what I noticed in a lot of the guzzles of uh, Ghalib, who is a very famous um, Urdu poet from a couple of centuries back in India. And his work, like a lot of um, the poets that are in this kind of, uh, I guess, very loosely in a kind of Sufi tradition, where there's a sense of the beloved being uh, God, but then you read it in a, in a different mood and it's actually the beloved is the lover, you know. Um, and so this poem really, I guess, kind of combines both of those things. Um, it does think about, you know, um, uh, perhaps God as kind of an absent person or a non-existent or a mystical sort of figure, but also, yeah, it really does consider the, the beloved, uh, the very physical, human, um, precious person that, that you uh, are deeply, deeply connected to. And it's certainly a, also a poem, I guess, of, uh, uh, what's the word for it? Yearning, I think, you know? Uh, yeah, it's, it, it is, again, as you say, it, it, these things are hard to kind of, uh, translate, but of course, that that's part of why we love poems. That uh, 
yeah, they're untranslatable, but they also make us want to talk more and think more and try to connect these things, you know. Um, yeah, it's interesting having to read these poems again, because it's been a while since I've read these. It, it's also, there's a bit of otherness to the, the poem because it's like, oh, I haven't read that for a while. Oh, that's, oh, that, that poem, yeah. You know, yeah, it, it's so fascinating. The, you're the person who wrote them, right? Yeah, I think so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I am, yeah. They came from somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, could you, now we're going to move away from Guzzles to some of the other poems in the book. Um, mm. you read um, their positions, please. Yeah, so um, uh, this section of the book is effectively a kind of, um, I would say, a kind of verse novella, you know, a kind of short, uh, fictionalised version of a person going to India to get uh, medical treatment. Um, so it deals with this thing of someone wanting to, you know, get something done that they need done, but also having it done in a place that is perhaps maybe more in need than they are. Um, so various poems deal with it in various ways, but um, this one is called Their Positions. In clusters of concertinaed flesh, outside the best hotels, the five-star hospitals, pressing their obvious conditions through crowded trains, or prone in the subway, moaning their one-word questions, or asleep in the dim light, these bodies, you could fall into them. Where I'll end up isn't so predictable. Sometimes I rush towards thinking less of everyone else, their gods with arms of stone. By then, the flinty echo of coins in a metal cup is a memory. When I do give something, somehow I expect one of us to disappear. What is this currency, I think, as a dog limps past, lies down underneath a parked car? And again, there's a lot, there's a lot going on in just a few words. Now, I love the dog limping past, the ubiquitous limping dog. Yeah. As the counterpoint to the ubiquitous beggar in India, mm. ending the poem on both sides. And then where I'll end up isn't so pred predictable. Mm. <laughs> um, what I do find in your, I mean, that's a thought that we all have. Where are we going to end up? Mm. Um, I do find in each of these poems that there's maybe a one line that jumps out and grabs me and will not let me go. It's, it's very well done. Um, and what is this currency? <laughs> well, mm. well, might we ask? Yeah. Um, and then just opposite that, that poem, that's so the preceding poem that I've chosen is Rituals. Yep. Uh, rituals too. Um, yeah, look, I guess both of these poems really deal with this kind of uh, being disoriented and the Westerner feeling uh, vulnerable in, in India and the kind of, uh, I guess, panic of that uh, and how to deal with uncertainty, I guess. Uh, so this poem is called Rituals and like uh, their position, the last one. It does really deal, I guess, with uh, um, the fear or uncertainty that a Westerner can have in India, but also this potential of being um, okay with uh, uncertainty. So this is called Rituals. Here I keep thinking of things I can't see. Not gods as such, though sometimes I wonder. It's those rituals I know too well that put me most at risk. I crane my neck as I brush my teeth, rinse my mouth out straight from the tap and stop myself just in time. They're teeming and multiplying on the bathroom doorknob on the end of this pen I just put in my mouth in a drop of water on a restaurant spoon. I can never pick up the low frequency of my own blood, but now a mosquito is singing its circuits of the room, then stops somewhere I can't see. 
sleep is weary of me and shallow. Above, the fan gently shudders as it turns. I wake suddenly lifted into an eerie, holy quiet. A soft rain falls on an empty intersection. Nothing will happen to me. Well, I read that, Andy, and, and I thought, how did he do that? Because <laughs> it just seems like a pandemic poem, but <laughs> it's got nothing to do with it. But it's like, it just seems yeah. topical now. Um, and then that final line, nothing will happen to me, which is, which is capable of so many interpretations, you know, as assertion or as wish or as belief or as prayer or as, mm. um, and how many of us, how many of us are thinking that, you know, in this time? That's yeah. Time. Yeah. And then the sort of necessity of thinking it, um, for your own sense of stability, oh, it's going to be okay. But also the danger of saying it too, that, um, you know, we know now particularly uh, that to assume is not a problem is a, is a problem. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, I, I think a lot of the, what I loved about writing this book is just this sense of, um, you, you're always implicated when you're in India. You're never just an observer. You're, you're in there and your own wealth and your privilege is kind of, well, it's all there to see. Mm. Uh, so some of the energy of these poems, I really like these poems and uh, even, yeah, they, they've got something that uh, doesn't happen anywhere else. Yeah. Yeah. No, so it was wonderful to read. And I, we've got one more poem from this book, um, Newsprint. Yeah. Right. Newsprint. The nurse asks again, but you haven't heard. You are passing the scene in slow motion, face pressed against the glass of the newspaper, something unspeakable turning in your bones like pleasure. Not relief at your safety, not homesickness cloaked with sympathy, or even some remnant you'd mistakenly call animal. You don't know for a long moment who you are. The young slum dweller who ran through the toxic smoke to rescue patients and now lies in intensive care. The hospital directors taken into custody. The crowd clamouring at the gates for the bodies of their loved ones. Or the police resorting to batons to subdue them. She takes your blood pressure and temperature. The alarms and sprinklers are switched on and work. All the emergency exits are unlocked. No boxes lock the stairwells. Only your fingers are black with newsprint. Yeah, the disorientation there is palpable, isn't it? I mean, whose body am I in? And mm. how, how do I recognise whose body I'm in? Yeah, yeah, and, and certainly, you know, again, this kind of thing of uh, we, we do connect up with other bodies and it's intuitive and it's immediate, uh, but at the same time, we also kind of acknowledge our difference and especially in India, um, yeah, you're very much aware of that difference and that kind of, uh, you know, I had multiple people say, oh, you've, you've, you've travelled to India, how much was your ticket? And you just feel kind of shame at even, oh no, it, it was a lot of money. You just don't want to, you can't really go there. It's, um, yeah, there's a big gap. Um, yeah. All right, well, now for a very different book. Yeah. Music Our Bodies Can't Hold, uh, which is um, basically a series of portraits, isn't it, of people that you know and some that you don't and some historical figures who may or may not have had Marfan syndrome. Um, and I was really interested in how you came to write this book too, because um, presumably the people that you spoke to consented to you doing what you did. And, and how was that entire process and how, how did it come about? What, what prompted the idea? Yeah, look, I'd, I'd written one or two poems. You know, like I think having a condition that's relatively rare, this is about sort of one in 5,000, or some people say one in 10,000, um, 
you, and are not particularly well known, especially when I was growing up. You sort of looking for, um, I guess, oh, who else has this? You know, <laughs> so I had written a couple of poems that were, I guess, portrait poems or kind of directed towards other people who had a condition. And just the idea came to me that, you know, I started writing more and more and it just became, you know, a self-fulfilling thing of, I think I, this is going to be a book. Um, so I, I put the call out uh, publicly through various kind of support networks and groups. Um, so I did maybe about a dozen interviews uh, of, with people by email, sometimes in person, but mostly by email. Uh, and so the book's a combination of those, but also probably the majority of it is research. As you say, some are historical figures. Uh, and there are other people whose uh, stories are online for various reasons, the newspaper articles and so on, uh, who aren't famous. And I tried my best to contact them. And when I couldn't contact them to kind of uh, negotiate what it would mean to use their story, um, I basically changed a lot of the details. So um, on one level, some of the names in here, they actually aren't the names of the people who's, uh. you know, if you go right back, you know, it, it's a different story on some level. Um, so they're, uh, yeah, they're all, they're all true. But um, yeah, some of the names have been changed to uh, preserve people's sort of privacy. Yeah. Yeah. And because it's it's yeah it's 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 not entirely my um, my story to tell. No. Which is why you only use the first names. Yeah, 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 indeed. And and also the first names too. Each poem is the name of the person, the first name, and it became a way of doc I guess democratizing the whole thing that you know Abraham Lincoln is just Abraham. Yeah. You know he's and he's the same importance as you know uh, Charlotte or uh, John, you know, they're, they're all on the same level, all in the same boat. Well, let's not keep everyone waiting. Let's, yeah. Let's <laughs> and start off with um, Dalton, please. Great. Um, I'll just say very quickly that um, Marfan syndrome is something that can affect um, the heart. Uh, so it can be a kind of a very, yeah, it can, it can risk your life. Uh, and there's a particularly severe variation of Marfan syndrome called neonatal Marfan. And this poem came, is in the voice of Dalton's mother. Um, yeah, and his story is, is in the poem, so I won't reveal it. <coughs> Dalton. When he held a flower for the first time, he smelled it without thinking and fell asleep. From day one, he was a fighter. I would walk him along the shaded path. We'd sit on this bench and soak up the sun. I still visit and think of him. One day I forgot to bring my usual flower, but there was a dandelion already there. Maybe someone placed it, but it didn't feel like that. He was a wise old soul. Doctors call him the little professor. He sat like an old man with one leg over his knee. His heart worked against him. His diaphragm would indent so severely from just one breath. One morning I placed my hand on his chest as the first of his arrhythmias began. 12 hours of surgery and only three months old. The doctor cried. A nurse asked us if we had a blanket to wrap him in, but he pulled through for a time. He didn't get to talk, but at times he'd say no or mama. He signed with his hands, would shake with excitement when he heard music. He always touched the piano keys so softly. In ER again, they brought him back, but I knew he was ready. He looked at me. I told him it was okay. I often see his little face 15 minutes before I wake. Smiling, he places his forehead to my lips. Yeah, well, that was, uh, I had to choose that poem. Um, 
I had to choose that poem. Yeah. Um, I'm um, glad you did, David. I'm really glad you did. Um, it's a beautiful, tender portrait and um, very, very moving and, and, and beautifully done. Um, and, you know, we're right there. We, we, we experience him a little bit of him. So thank you. It's a bit of a gift, that poem. Yeah. And I always feel um, a huge uh, kind of indebtedness to, um, yeah, to the family uh, for kind of giving me their story. Mm. And for the poems, this is, was one of the interview poems. And for each of those, I did use a lot of their words and um, some of my own, but mostly their words. And I gave them the poem before it was published to you know, edit or change or anything they wanted. So it's almost a collaboration, really. Yeah. Oh, it's precious. Um, and then um, I chose Isaiah. Yeah, uh, Isaiah is um, Isaiah Austin, who is a uh, basketball player. Uh, in this poem, he does kind of, um, he is effectively, uh, you know, a rising star. And uh, because there's, with uh, sort of exercise, it puts a bit of pressure on the heart. And so people who, are, who have Marfan are advised not to do uh, sort of excessive activity like that. So, you know, this is kind of heartbreaking. Apparently, though, after I wrote this poem, he's gone on to continue playing. Um, so, you know, the, as usual, things are more complicated than they seem. But, uh, so this is Isaiah. Eighth grade, the pre-game, eighth grade, the pre-game warm-up, I dunk and land. Then all I see is blood coming out, my retina detached. A few years on, it droops, loses color, shrinks to the point where I have no pupil. Four operations to save it, but it wasn't to be. This eye is acrylic glass. You can make it your excuse or you can make it your story. My mom told me that long ago. The boom of the ball, the squeak of sneakers, the air moving, it all helps. But mostly I keep my head on a swivel so I know what's happening, who's coming. Ray, my coach, brought the dog out of me, but you can't teach seven foot one. Even teams that had no interest were rooting for me. Said I'd have a long career. Four days before the NBA draft, just the thought of hearing my name, goosebumps. The standard exam, they picked something up. Told me the arteries in my heart are enlarged. If I push too hard, it could rupture. The stadium's full, my career is over. I know what won't happen, but can't stop a tear coming up. A standing ovation. I'm on stage. My name has been drafted. My body can't be. The insurance claim is in, but who knows? For we walk by faith, not by sight. Tattooed on my arm. It's not the end. It's only the beginning. Yeah, and, and what I took away from that, without knowing that he went mm. back and played, yeah is that sense um, of possibility, the door is, there are other doors to open and there's still yeah. life to lead. And I really like the optimism that that em embraces despite the devastation of, you know, being told you can't play. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's, there's perhaps something um, in the book. I mean, there's a huge diversity of people in there and, you know, you get all different, attitudes as well but perhaps you know determination uh is one of those things that is is in the book overall oh and true. perhaps even this theme of kind of just being able to just keep going um yeah. and find your own way of uh living within your own body and and resilience and um philosophy a philosophical approach to to life and mm. it's i mean it's quite inspiring um and I think that comes out in the next poem, um, Angela, that I would like you to read. Yeah. Uh, Angela is, um, yeah, a, uh, I 
guess she is, I can't remember her age, but yeah, 1970 to 2006. All those Sundays, I'd stare up at the angels and saints in the windows. I wanted also to be a boy, wear pants like my brothers. Stephen and I would pose as the icons. We had their expressive fingers, angular features, so it was easy to enter into them, pious and laughing. In the schoolyard, I was clumsy and found myself in a corner of the library. Can reason hold or explain any of us? I was drawn to the apocalyptic imagery of Byzantine art, the light that seems to weep from everywhere, but mostly from the body. And I was lucky. Scholarships gave me Greece, the living presence of the frescoes and mosaics. At 22, I, was, I rushed myself into emergency. My faith in the surgeons was rewarded that time. And once more, but you don't need to know everything I've gone through. History has its way with us. I was about to take up a post as assistant professor when it came to this. Mum sat with me and held my hand, told me stories, slept beside me. I was sleepless, exhausted from wrestling the infection. No flowers. St. Luke's Orthodox mission and the Marfan Foundation will take out donations. This body has gone, but I'm here in the images in the walls. Yes, and in the memories that people have. Um, but I loved, again, the, the, the philosophical history has its way with us, as, as it does with everyone, and like shrug the shoulders and get on with it, mm. and, and make the most of the life you have. And uh, there's nothing, sentimental here it's very sort of matter of fact and 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 stoic really. yeah um, yeah indeed and I, I i i loved her and i this is one of my one of my favorite poems in the, in the collection mm -hmm. just because of that kind of um yeah unassuming attitude that she has and this sense of uh um, also, this kind of, I mean, I, I like her, her line. I like to say her line because it's, it's her line as much as it's mine. Um, you don't need to know everything I've gone through. Oh, yeah. You know, it's like at the same time as you're telling your story, you're saying, well, you know, it's not all about me. Yeah. But also, yeah. and I was lucky. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Many people who are lucky don't understand that they're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, that's right. It's a, it's a certain, uh, there's some kind of fortunate, uh, thing if you can see your luck and appreciate it and mm. uh, dwell in it for sure. All right, so another poem I actually absolutely had to have you read is, is Peter. Yeah, again, uh, this is one of my favorites too, actually. So, you know, we, we must have similar tastes. Uh, Peter is Peter Mayhew. Um, uh, so, uh, Star Wars fans will obviously know who he is. Um, and of course the poem kind of explains this, uh, but yeah, Peter Mayhew is a fantastic actor, uh, but one of those actors who you normally see uh, within a, a costume of Chewbacca. So he's not famous, but he's very famous at the same time, which I can identify with, I can say. Peter, I was a hospital orderly until the newspapers published a shot of my feet. Suddenly I was cast as the Minotaur in Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger. You might know Star Wars a little better. To get the role of Chewbacca, all I had to do was stand up. George Grin. I watched the bears and gorillas at the zoo for days. On set, I'd growl, grunt and shriek. None of us knew what was coming. We thought it was another B-movie, period. One day I was sick and they put someone else in the suit. He was good, but they had to trash all the footage. He just couldn't embody the Wookiee. Between films, I went back to work at the hospital. Back then, there were no conventions or appearance money. At seven foot one, you stand out, though no one knows you. Does it matter? In Latin, persona is mask, so the mask is the person. As Darth, 
R2-D2, Boba Fett and Chewie, we walk into the children's wards, bring them toys and open the windows, you can imagine. Whether you're, old, whether you're young or old, I appear as a teddy bear, a security blanket. The new suit has a built-in cooling system, so it's better. You still don't want to know what it's like inside. So uh, I hope all the other Star Wars tragics out there like me enjoy that as much as I did. Did you interview him at all? Did you get in contact with him? No, no, I didn't. Um, I would have loved to because uh, all the sort of interviews that I read and, and watched, um, he just seems like a really charismatic and funny and down-to-earth guy. Like, uh, yeah, I mean, you, hopefully you can hear that in the palm. He's just yeah. such a gorgeous man. Um, yeah. And yeah, it was, it was a real loss that he's uh, kind of, yeah, not with us anymore. Uh, but um, he made it yeah. to the end of the series, which not too many of the characters did. At least Chewbacca made it to the end of the series. Yeah, yeah, well, that's right, that's right. So, um, no, no, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan now. And I, I, of course, I mean, it's, it's funny, uh, you think uh, in researching it, you kind of, all these surprises kept coming up. I mean, but oh, him as well, you know, and so. It was great. And then you finally you look at him and you go, well, of course, you know, he had, <laughs> does have all the features that you would imagine, um, the, or the typical kind of Marfan features. So, yeah, yeah, it's great fun coming, coming, coming upon him. Mm. And so we come to the last poem that you're going to read for us. Yeah, uh, so the, the structure of the book, I should say, um, I decided, you know, it had to have some kind of, it could have gone on forever. So I ended up deciding to uh, write 46 poems, two sets of 23 to match the number of chromosomes in the human body. Um, and what I realized was that um, somebody said to me, well, are you gonna write one in your own voice? And I thought, oh, well, maybe I should. And one of the uh, perennial questions through the whole book, especially as it was coming out was, this dawning sense of responsibility for these lives that uh, it's, it is my story because it's a condition that I share, but it's also not my story. And so there's this real tension in the book between embracing these other lives and also holding them with respect, um, which is, you know, that, that's kind of poetry overall, isn't it? Like that's, we're, we're putting ourselves out there, but also we, it's a very, there's an ethical quality to what we do. Mm. So this poem is called Moonlight, and it starts with a quote from the Lankavatara Sutra, which is, just as a fool on seeing a moon pointing finger looks at the finger but not the moon, so one who is attached to words does not see the real. My body shaped itself into a question mark. I wasn't that interested in answers. Slowing down, I felt a tension in the chest, shame burrowed into muscle. Not the end of a sentence, but its beginning. Skin thinks of itself as an absolute border. It takes effort to wonder who else we could be. So I come to each of you confused trying hard to listen. Sometimes in your stillness, I think I see my own dying. Trace a slow and tender finger along the surface of your lives. When you wince, I pull my hand back, afraid these lines could be incisions. Easy to forget poetry is not surgery or a ramp, not an embrace or a letting go but a way of leaning carefully into whispers so we can sense ourselves in the seemingly empty spaces. Pausing, I see at the base of each fingernail, a small rising moon. It takes effort to wonder who else we could be. Thank you mm. for wondering, Andy, and for sharing the wonder with us. That's Pleasure. Been- you on um and uh, when the video is posted there will be information on it about how to get hold of andy's books 
so please feel free. Um, and we'll be back next month with Jeff Goodfellow on the theme of working class lives, and that'll be that'll be great. Thank you very much.